start. My title is Teresa of Jesus Carmelite. And I start with a quotation uh, from uh, Teresa from the uh, uh, Book of uh, Foundations. And she says this, For the love of our Lord, I beg you to remember the favor of our Lord has been granted to you uh, in this order. Fix your eyes always on the ancestry from which we come, those holy prophets. How many saints we have in heaven who have worn this habit? She ends by saying, in Theresian style, amen, amen, thanks be to God. That was her final words. Here we are at another celebration of the fifth centenary of the birth of Teresa of Jesus, and justly so. This Castilian woman could have slipped without notice into the dustbin of history. Instead, she is one of the world's most admired women. Teresa, who lived her life with gusto, would be puzzled by Thoreau's gloomy conviction that most people lead a life of quiet, quiet desperation. Right. Nor was Teresa a restless vagabond, as Felipe Sega uh, said she was, uh, and who was corrected by none other than St. John Paul II, who said, no, 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 she wasn't a, rest a reckless, restless uh, vagabond, she was God's vagabond. <laughs> Teresa and her family could easily have been driven from Spain, as we've seen from Leopold, as was the lot of others with Jewish blood. Indeed, Teresa's stature grows with each passing year. Known to French Catholics as La Grande Therese, in distinction, of course, to La Petite Therese. The church's recognition of Teresa includes a speedy uh, beatification, uh, and then on the same day in 1622, imagine if you were in Rome for this uh, canonization. Canonized that day, Ignatius of Loyola, Francis Xavier, Philip Neri, and Isidore the farmer, and Teresa. Literally, there were fireworks on that day in, in Rome. The church has not only canonized this wretched woman, calls herself Ruin, um, but she has also been declared the first uh, female doctor of the church. That means that Teresa has wisdom not merely for the few, always a danger in religious circles, uh, but for the global church and beyond. As you well know, Teresa's daughters and sons, you, uh, affectionately referred to her as La Madre. She's the mother. Love has no geographical or temporal boundaries. Teresa's daughters have every right uh, to feel greatly loved by her. She wrote to Gracian, and we only have a fragment of this letter, but in this letter she's talking about the nuns and she says, I love them dearly, tenderly. These accolades and more have accrued into, to Teresa, Doña Teresa Sanchez de Omaha y Cepeda. Who, why? Because she chose to become a Carmelite, not in name only, but with extraordinary single-mindedness, or as Teresa would say, con determinación determinada frequently occurs. Now, how about an identity crisis? You know when you've been through one of those. Psychoanalyst Eric Erickson, who coined the term identity crises, decided later on in life that this phrase was much too static. Identity crises, Erickson suggested, needs to be read dynamically, something like this. What do I want to make of myself, and what do I have to work with? These two questions imply, in Christian terms, the dynamic of the exercise of freedom and the gift of grace. I shall not explore Teresa's identity from a psychological perspective. I just can't do that. I don't know enough. Some of you could do very well with that. What I do is turn to the historical record 
and see what it uh, reveals about the evolution up to a certain period in her life of Teresa's identity. Teresa's vocational struggle has reverberated down through the centuries, down to our own time. I call my presentation, Teresa of Jesus Carmelite, and I take this title from Teresa herself. Only two of her letters are left from her years at the Incarnacion. Both of these letters are signed, Doña Teresa de Ahumada. The second of these letters, dated 1561, is the last time that Teresa signs herself with the familial uh, designation. Between 1568 and 1578, 37 of Teresa's letters are signed, Teresa de Jesus, Carmelita. My presentation explores Teresa's Carmelite identity, but constraints of time require that I limit myself to the evolution of the identity of Teresa until she reaches the age of 47, when th at that period God sends her on the mission of foundations. Teresa's identity includes so many rich paradoxes that her identity defies facile epithets. She was, for example, deeply uh, contemplative, yet eminently practical, demanding of high standards, yet extremely compassionate. And the list goes on and on. Richly endowed with natural gifts, Teresa responded generously to the gift of Christ's grace. And she knew, too, the gift of living in God's glory, something we still haven't learned, that it's nature, grace, and glory. We cut out the glory. Because, listen to her write to the nuns at San Jose. Even from here below, you can begin to enjoy glory. It is a glory that begins with baptism. As John of the Cross says in a neglected statement, the grace of contemplation is the very same grace as the grace of baptism. The implications of John's conviction absolutely boggles the mind with what we've been doing in our invitation to holiness and prayer for the church at large and for religious communities. Teresa ponders her future. The Discalced Carmelite scholar Daniel Maroto calls a time in Teresa's life her stormy adolescence. And he also has another little section where he says, the time of her first loves. Remember your first loves? Her dearly loved mother, Beatrice, died when Teresa was about 14. Perhaps Beatrice's death triggered the turbulence in Teresa's struggle. Teresa reports friendships with cousins that she knew were not what they should be, the relationships. She even speaks of a relationship with a cousin who may well have been a prospective uh, marriage partner. No wonder what would have happened to her if she had married. That, so there it goes. <laughs> Faced with the turmoil in his daughter's life, Alonso de Cepeda packed up his rambunctious daughter and entrusted her to the Augustinian nuns at the Avila Monastery of Our Lady of Grace. There, he thought, to cool her heels. <laughs> Teresa stayed with the Augustinian nuns for a year and a half uh, at the age of 16 to 17, and it's a time of very special grace. Teresa says, I found many good nuns there who are very modest, religious, circumspect. A special instrument of grace was the nun Doña Maria de Brasenia who made a profound impact on a young woman who was wrestling with what path she would take in life. Teresa describes her mentor as very discreet and holy. From other sources, we know that Maria Bresenia was young, sweet, open, and outgoing. Qualities that appealed to an adolescent puzzled about who she would become. We could have told her this, but you know, she didn't look forward far enough. <laughs> Teresa was, she says, I don't want to be a nun. The 
the Lord, she says that that's a rough translation of the, of the Spanish. <laughs> Yet she clearly cherished the good and holy conversations that she had with Maria Briseña. Teresa's time with the Augustinian nuns was cut short when she became ill. Still, she reports that her time with them ma made her a better person. Mystified, Teresa asked God that God might show me the state in which I was to serve him. But still, I didn't want to be a nun. <laughs> and I asked God not to give me that vocation. Although, you know what, she says, I also feared marriage. Although Teresa was uh, impressed with the nuns at Our Lady of Grace, and though she left there more favorable to the thought of being a nun, she found the monastery too extreme, and that some of the youngest Augustinian nuns were not of one mind. Was Teresa even then looking for a community where all must be friends, all must be loved, all must be held dear, all must be helped. You remember her words from the way of perfection. Teresa surely qualifies for what Pope Francis summons religious to be, experts in community. Uh, in a couple of weeks, if I can move fast, I have to do a, a lecture on that. University of Notre Dame is going to have a series on what Francis might mean, and I'm gonna to try to speak from the Carmelite tradition. What does the Carmelite tradition say about the importance of religious community? Nonetheless, Teresa's time with the Augustinian nuns was a blessed stage in her time of discernment. At Our Lady of Grace, Teresa gained clarity about God's will for her, and once she made up her mind to become a Carmelite, Teresa never looked back. Teresa sums up her choice of Carmel in very mundane terms. For her, uh, this was too important for flowery rhetoric. She says, I had a good friend, un grande amiga, and were I to become a nun, I would have not done so except in a convent where she is. That great friend was Doña Juana Suarez who not only drew Teresa to the Incarnation, but Juana was also among that small circle of friends who in Teresa's last two years at the Incarnacion uh, were trying to figure out what should Carmelite life be like now in the 16th century. Um, back to Teresa, who added further reasons for her choice of the Incarnation. I was determined to go where I could serve God more or, and then she throws in the really important line, or where my father wanted me to be. Since Alonzo objected to her becoming a nun while he was alive, not over my dead body, he said, Teresa had, made, uh, had to make her way furtively early one morning on the Feast of All Souls to the Incarnation when she was 20 years old. That brief chaunt from her home at La Maneda, the name of her uh, homestead, uh, to the Incarnation was a very brief journey, but a very one important one in Carmelite history. Teresa spent the next 27 years at the Incarnation. There she discovered the compelling beauty of the Carmelite tradition, uh, a uh, theme in Carmelite spirituality that's dear to Blessed Titus. Uh, and she found ways while she was there to reinvigorate that Carmelite tradition. There, Teresa explored what it meant to be a Carmelite. And for, our, for us and for our inspiration, she lived, as Francis would have her live, Evangelii Gaudium, with the joy of the gospel. A few words on John Soroth, who already Leopold has given us an excellent background. But I need to pause momentarily to fill in a little bit of the background for Teresa. To do so, we go back to Blessed John Soroth, who was prior general from 1451 until his death in 1471 of the predecessors to Father Fernando. 44 years. <laughs> Someday we'll be saying, blessed Fernando, right? <laughs> 44 years after Sora's death, and this is an important connection, 
uh, Teresa was born. Um, Soros was a vigorous advocate for the reform of the Carmelite order. Until Soros' time, there were no females as full members of the Carmelite order. That all changed under Soros when Pope Nicholas V in 1452 promulgated the bull cum nulle. And I can't, I have a little note here that I wrote in over my text. We should have called three shouts because no Soros, no Therese, no you. Lots of you out there that you just wouldn't be around. And also the laity who are here, including myself. Soros never managed to travel to Spain, yet his leadership sowed the seeds of reform that could only flourish because he sowed them and Teresa took them up. Soros reform made possible the founding of Carmelite monasteries of women on the Iberian Peninsula. The Monastery of the Incarnation at Avila traces its beginning to 1479 when Doña Elvira Gonzalez, a concubine, nonetheless, of Don Junio Gonzalez, uh, who this woman, Elvira, started a Beaterio, as Leopold has mentioned. One scholar calls Donna, uh, Doña Elvira the great, great grandmother of Teresa. Better add figuratively, of course. You catch that? No? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess not. You have to help me out, Leopold. He sometimes doesn't get a laugh either for what he thinks is going to be a joke. A second site for this Beaterio was known as Holy Mary of the Incarnation, the name of the monastery. About the year 1500, the Incarnation came under the jurisdiction of the Carmelite order. The final move for the Incarnation came April the 4th, 1515. Guess who was baptized that day? Teresa that was in the parish church. She was baptized that very day. Um, she, and her name came from her maternal grandmother. At the time, the incarnation was moved to its present site outside the majestic walls of Avila, the walls that Teresa would have walked around frequently, and she would have seen uh, the incarnation frequently and visited there often because she had relatives at the monastery. Doña Teresa de Hamada became a postulant at the Encarnacion on All Souls Day in 1535. One year later on the same feast in 1536, Teresa received the Carmelite habit. She made her permanent profession of vows on November 3rd, a year and a day, like the jail sentence. They go together, canon law and sentences to jail. And she made these vows at a time when there was no option for temporary profession. All or nothing. Is that, and she made it all. Teresa spent the next 27 years at the Incarnation. That is until 1562 when she founded the Monastery of San Jose in Avila, which in 2012 celebrated its 450th anniversary. I'd say that's a staying power. Um, I took a group of students there right before the centenary, and my Spanish was bad, their English wasn't so good, and we found out we could sing songs to each other, and we had a great time spending about an hour and a half singing, and then at the end of us, it was a wonderful time in this great monastery that Teresa, her first one to found. Teresa returned to the incarnation as prioress, not of her own free will, from 1571 until 1574, when St. John of the Cross became her confessor at the Incarnation. In all, Teresa was a member of the Carmelite community of the Incarnation for 30 of her 67 years. That's more, almost half of her lifetime. And she could have lived there were, it, were she not Teresa, uh, unnoticed by the world. Teresa de Jesus Carmelita put an indelible stamp on Carmelite life and Christian spirituality and mysticism. Male writers in the 16th century referred to women like Teresa as varoniles, manly women. And these men said, felt, that that was the best compliment they could pay. <laughs> the incarnation as crucible. Teresa has a knack, uh, it's lovely to watch for them, uh, apt figures of speech and striking metaphors. She used the imagery of the crucible a number of times. 
Taking my cue from her, I find the crucible an apt image to describe Teresa's time at the incarnation. Crucible implies testing, severe testing, and conditions which bring about change. Teresa's time at the incarnation involved her intense testing, personal transformation, as well as the discovery of a renewed vision of how Carmelites might pray and live. Like gold in a crucible, Teresa became at the incarnation, these are her words, more refined and purified. A Carmelite better prepared to, to carry out the mission God is giving to her. Unfortunately, the details of Teresa's formation as a Carmelite at the Incarnation are few. Uh, most Carmelites in Spain, uh, and, and there, there are still feuds going on of interpretation, say we don't know who the, the uh, uh, novice mistress. It would be important to know that if we knew who it was and what she did to form uh, Teresa. However, there are two extraordinary scholars, one in Ocarm and one in Discalce, who claim it was Doña Maria de Luna. We don't know. Anyway, that's what uh, uh, our first speakers call a tidbit. <laughs> the almost three de decades that Teresa spent at the Incarnation were a time of important discoveries crucial to her understanding of what it means to be a Carmelite. With profession, Teresa became a juridical member of the Carmelite order. But as with love, a vocation a calling is not static, but dynamic. As Heraclitus said long ago, you cannot step into the same stream at the same place twice. And I remembered and jotted it down, this quote from when Teresa's talking about love. She says, I hold that love, where present, cannot possibly be content with remaining always the same. Padre Tomas Alvarez says that at the incarnation, and I'm quoting from him, so it's not me, this is Alvarez, Teresa suffered a long and hard temptation to mediocrity. Now that's not saying, we, now we would mean by that, that's real bad. Uh, Acris is a, a mountain, a, j a jagged mountain, Medio is halfway up, and if you're halfway up, you're doing pretty well. But what, what he's saying about Teresa, she was going to be willing to let God take her higher. If you watch the interior castle, the first three uh, mansions take you as far as mediocrity. At the incarnation, despite her struggles, Teresa's heart grew and expanded and became ever more inflamed with the love of God. Remember her imagery from the Psalm 119, uh, or 18, depending on your numbering, uh, when you enlarged my heart, Lord. Imagery that Teresa used because as she grew in prayer and grew in love, and those are the same kinds of growth, uh, she was trying to say, that there's a place down, down, deep within us that God can take us. Teresa Harley uh, shares all uh, that we'd like to know about her time at the Incarnation, but she shares more than one can possibly explore in a single presentation. My focus, therefore, be, will be on several fundamental aspects of Teresa's evolution as she grew as a Carmelite. Keep Heraclitus' principle in mind. She who could not tolerate being a Carmelite by habit. In exploring Teresa's Carmelite life, one also needs to acknowledge the profound mystery of Teresa's spiritual journey. As we dig in the past, we must admit to what both Thomas Aquinas and Karl Rahner maintain, that God is a mystery. And then they both maintain, we are a mystery. We cannot fully explain ourselves. And we must uh, obey the mystery of who is Teresa. We're not going to come up with the final picture of who she is. Access to mystery is partial at best. 
Bernini, for instance, tried with his sculpture to suggest the depth of Teresa's passionate love. Teresa, during her formation, possibly as a postulant, surely as a novice, began to discover a blueprint for what she was meant to be as a Carmelite. That blueprint, of course, was the Carmelite rule, Carmel's charter of life, its magna carta. There, Teresa found much help that would shape her identity. A few words on the Carmelite rule. Teresa's Spain, as we've learned um, uh, this morning, was insulated from much of the ecclesiastical turmoil that took place beyond the Pyrenees. Yet Teresa was born into an era and a land searching for renewal and reform. Reform was in the air everywhere, and the notion of renewal was often put in terms of the primitive church. And this is important for the insight that Teresa had. For instance, she's uh, visiting uh, Palencia, and she finds the life that the Christians there are living admirable. And she says, it just seemed to me it was like living in the primitive church. You can almost hear the wheels in Teresa's mind figuring out where to go for inspiration. Teresa was 30 years old when the Council of Trent got underway, and 48 when it finally ended, 31 when Martin Luther died in 1546. As Leopold says, exciting times. During the late Middle Ages, permanent effective reform of Catholic institutions eluded even the best of intentions. Uh, if you watch what was going on, it was a kind of mechanical reform, uh, trying to make sure uh, people lived a common life and they fasted on the right days. They weren't getting at the heart of the matter. Uh, and that's what's so important about Ignatius of Loyola and Teresa of Avila. They, are, uh, they have broken through and discovered what we had to wait until Vatican II, and I'll come back to that. Among the Carmelites of the late Middle Ages, there were not a few wonderful reforms, like that of Soreth, certainly, and that of Mantua. However, enduring reforms among religious communities did not materialize until Ignatius and Teresa, and until they discovered this, and this is their discovery. Enduring and effective renewal of religious communities depend on the communal commitment to personal prayer, mental prayer, as Teresa speaks of it, or elsewhere in an article I have suggested that we use the terminology to help contemplative meditation. In other words, con contemplation is, you can't be fully human unless you're a contemplative. And contemplative orders are there as a witness to the whole world of the importance that one cannot be fully human without being a contemplative. Teresa explores the rule. Teresa uh, studied the rule, uh, and she turned to that rule, which was Pope Innocent IV's uh, uh, rule, and she calls it, and I'll fill in these little details because I think it's important to how she became a reformer, she calls the rule of 1247 la regla prima or regla primitiva. Uh, Teresa was technically correct in saying that. Now, I, I'm going to make a penance. I'm, I'm hoping that Father Fernando has full faculties to absolve from, from horrible sins. Uh, many of us were saying, why didn't Teresa know about the formula of life? And that, Technically, she's right. There was no rule until 1247, and the rule was papally uh, approved. And so Teresa goes to that rule, because in Ribot, whom uh, Leopold mentioned, uh, both of those rules appear. They're both in there. A Carmelite makes a profession, you, all of us in the Carmelite family, according to the rule. That is, promises to live the rule, and not only to know it, like the interpretation of scripture, the ultimate interpretation of the rule is performance. What counts is not what one knows or says, like this 
guy up here right now saying, what, what one says about the rule, it all depends on how one lives the rule. When the rule fully informs one's life, then it becomes a living rule, something like the living word of God. Teresa de Ahamada, like other Carmelites then and now, made her profession of vows according to the rule. As a Carmelite, the rule became her vision of how she would grow. She's choosing from those sources of the rule, and I'll mention something else in a moment, uh, to, to figure out who she should be. If she's promised to be a Carmelite, that was an evolution over time. Teresa obviously scrutinized the rule very carefully. She quotes the rule more than any other document except scripture. Moreover, Teresa inherited or intuited the wisdom of, of, of the ages about a religious rule. Bossuet, the famous French priest, uh, uh, preacher, uh, picks up on the tradition and says, a rule is an ab abridgment of the gospel. And that became a shibboleth for uh, the, the 16th century. Um, listen to Teresa says th this, all that is in our rule and constitution serves for nothing else than a means toward keeping these commandments and for greater perfection. Teresa refers to the gospel's first and greatest commandment, love of God and love of neighbor. That's what she's saying the rule does for you. It, it allows you to practice those virtues which were central for the preaching of Jesus Christ. I also should have mentioned this, that uh, Patrick mentioned that my mentor was Dom David Knowles, uh, who, by the way, you religious would like this. He died in October. Uh, 1974, and I had a letter from him at the end of July. And in that letter he said, my dearest Keith, the longer I live, the more I am convinced that to pray is to love. That was to a, a student, it was a very strong message. The formula of life that Albert, Patriarch of Jerusalem, approved between 1206 and 1214 was designed for hermits on Mount Carmel. When some of these hermits migrated to Europe in 1238, the formula of life had to be amended. Why had it to be amended? Because the Dominicans and the Franciscans were everywhere. They were answering the church's appeal for ministry. And the, uh, what the uh, Carmelites chose was to be mendicant or to be extinct. That was pretty sure what was at, what was at stake. The, this document contained, 1247, uh, amendments that made possible Carmel's entry into the ranks of the mendicant orders. It's interesting. Teresa or John never, ever suggested that the Carmelites discontinue apostolic ministry. That's not a really, you know, you read there, sometimes you think Teresa's going to send everybody back to a hermitage and they're never going to get out and do anything. Um, Significantly, Teresa anticipated, this I think is extraordinary, I know prophecy doesn't mean, for Teresa and John, prophecy means what one says as a result of encountering God. That has nothing to do with future. This is their constant way that they talk uh, about prophets. But Teresa, in this case, was prophetic in the, that she anticipated the principles of reform and renewal for religious orders that do not appear until perfecte caritatis, uh, the, on the renewal of religious orders in the, among the Vatican documents. And there it is said to retrieve, that religious are called to retrieve their original charism and to adapt their lives to conditions of the time. Father Fernando mentioned that. It, you can't, we're not antiquarians. We're not building a museum. Uh, we are here to follow Christ. Teresa went back to Carmel's original charism, the rule. And in addition, she insisted that the mitigations of the rule approved by uh, Pope Eugene IV must be rejected. These mitigations allowed meat to be eaten on certain days and recognized that the friars uh, needed to move about more freely than what the rule seemed to allow. This is a very strong statement coming up, so hold your, under your chair. 
uh, a dearly beloved Carmelite who died just a few years ago, Father Joachim Smet, has this to say, which sounds like a, he was a discalc, but I, we're all sure he was au carm. Um, <laughs> Joachim, who I walked into his library one day, and he was picking up his, his uh, pills and taking them, and he looked at me in the doorway and said, Keith, uh, getting old sucks. <laughs> Gentle, gentle Joachim, who never said a coarse thing uh, in his life. Now I want to say what he said, and that was this. Eugene's mitigation has been the source of every subsequent division in the order. I'm not going to solve that. That's Father Fernando can go back to Rome and talk to his council about that. The original Carmelites, the Holy Fathers, for all its importance, the Carmelite rule is a text a document. Human, human experience can bring life to a text. None of the original Carmelite hermits are known by name. We kind of fudge a bit and say O.B. was a brocard, but that's probably not very accurate. Um, and now missing at this time for Teresa are two wonderful saints whom she adored. She calls them uh, glorious uh, Saint Dominic and glorious Saint Francis. And everybody is idolizing them, and the Carmelites are sitting there saying, we came from a hillside in a ravine in the Holy Land, and we think it's pretty important. Uh, however, Teresa found heroic Carmelites whom she considered the original Carmelites. She was passionate about having her daughters look to them as models. So she's, she says, here's the rule, now here are people who lived that rule. In the Carmelite rule, the phrase, the Holy Fathers, appears twice. The first refers to figures from the Latin tradition of religious life. At the beginning of the rule, she wants, Albert wants to say, this is, uh, we're continuing uh, uh, religious life here, of the great saints of the past, and calls them Holy Fathers. And then later when the rule says in 1247, we're going to pray out of the liturgical tradition that the Holy Fathers, the I'll, let me just explain this in a moment. Um, but Teresa, she's uh, not to be bound by the rules of, of hermeneutics. Uh, Teresa looks at that and said, those were the original hermits. Now, where would she get the idea, or where would she describe them, or why uh, so uh, dramatically? Um, we know that the young Carmelites in the Carmelite constitution Quite probably from 1247, certainly from 1281, the first thing that the postulants and novels read, uh, uh, what do they call them? Postulants and novices, that's the guy, that's their book. Uh, uh, the first thing they read from then until Teresa. Teresa, when she came, read the same thing, and that is, what do we tell the young? You know, we can't give them that story about the mountainside in uh, Mount Carmel. There were holy fathers there who lived a life of contemplation. And Teresa um, will get her graphic notion of what they lived like because of a wonderful document that is now in the Carmelite archive, uh, archives. I, I was there a couple years ago and held it in my hand. I attempted to steal it, but <laughs> the penalties of hell were too strong for me. Uh, but there it is uh, by Philip Ribot, Catalonian provincial, and in this document, on this side is Latin, and on this side is Spanish. And it says in the rubric, read this now, read this now, read this now. That's, that's dinner time reading. Remember when your grandmothers were Carmelites that they had reading uh, at the table? Um, a manuscript copy is there, and we know that Teresa had it. And if you know Teresa at all, remember her statements, I like to read good books very much, she would not have been satisfied with hearing it at the table. Uh, she would have read it. And that's where she talks then about those holy fathers on Mount Carmel, in whom such great solitude and contempt for the world sought this treasure. What was the treasure? The precious pearl of contemplation. She urged her daughters to live as these men live, and Teresa recommended to her nuns that they observe poverty because poverty, and this is a quote, was so esteemed and well kept by our holy fathers. These holy fathers, whom she called holy prophets, 
inspired Teresa to live as the original Carmelite hermits that she came to know. For Teresa, the rule was not a mere antiquary document. Uh, the rule was there to be lived with fidelity. And now I'm going to take, I'm not going to finish this because I, I knew that I only had so much time. And then besides that, um, uh, it, it's homework to do afterwards. I'm going to try to take what I think are the most important elements that Teresa found in the rule and then use that methodology to uh, keep studying the rule. First of all, Teresa found in the rule that she was to live a life of allegiance to Jesus Christ. I know some other translations now, but uh, that's another story. In, in, in a general audience, um, February the 2nd, 2011, Pope Benedict XVI, who was talking that day on Teresa, said, for Teresa, the Christian life is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which culminates in union with him through grace, love, and imitation. Teresa speaks of this discipleship, that's what Carmelites are called to, as all Christians are, uh, as the love with which we have imitated the life of our good Jesus, as she calls him. Everything, uh, uh, I've heard this out of the Carmelite tradition, um, and I think it needs to be engraved in stone. The key to the religious life and to the Christian life is to grow in a loving, living relationship, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Then everything falls in place, uh, not some law. Teresa had to learn, uh, now, in other words, what Teresa discovers there is uh, that this relationship with Christ, the, the rule starts out that way and then says what that kind of life would be like, including wearing God's armor. Um, and, and I think Teresa is a living icon of the Carmelite rule. But she had to learn uh, that a fad of her time, trying to pass the humanity of Christ, and Father Fernando spoke of this moment in which Teresa corrects herself. She went astray and she tried this out. Now my guess is she got headaches so badly that she said, oh my, I can't do that anymore. Um, uh, this is what she says. God desires that if we're going to please him, we must do it so through God's sacred humanity of Christ. Even from the perspective of her encounter with the triune God in spiritual marriage, she saw the importance of growing in one's relationship with the crucified Christ. Wonderful, powerful lines that come in the seventh dwelling places. Poned los oos, in el crucificado, y arazios, todo poco. Fix your eyes on the crucified Christ and everything will be as it should be. Now, to continue that relationship with Christ, Teresa and the Eucharist, Rule, uh, and I have a number here, but yeah, there's all kinds of numbers we've been using recently. The rule calls for the daily celebration of the Eucharist when that can be done without difficulty. The Eucharist celebrated at the center, at the heart of the collection of little cells. The cells on Mount Carmel were cellula, not cella, which would be a regular cell, tiny, tiny cells, like, like phone booths. Remember phones like that? You know, we didn't have them in our pockets. <laughs> Teresa speaks about being outside myself uh, with the desire for communion, and then takes up with that classical taste uh, text in uh, The Way of Perfection, uh, chapter 35, in which uh, she says, because people couldn't, they, the nuns couldn't go to communion every day, only so many days, and they were not very many. Uh, they had to get special permission from a confessor. Uh, she uh, tells them, uh, she, the woman of desires, uh, whom we know her to be, uh, uh, it, it, it says that I want you during the day to uh, go deep within to find the desire for union with Christ in the Eucharist. Um, and uh, that's important because if we're going to live that today, we just might have to practice communion by desire for reasons that you already are aware of. 
the, Teresa on this is quoted by Francis de Sales and John Paul II. The church at Teresa's time stressed the reception of communion rather than participation in the dying and rising of Christ. That's a limitation of the time, and Teresa had that limitation. And we can't go to her and find her talking about the theology of the celebration of the Paschal mystery, because that's, that wasn't available. And that shows us that what she knew, we need to have a few letrados around, a few people who know something of the whole uh, tradition. Teresa, a woman of prayer and contemplation. The Carmelite rule was a clarion call to Teresa to be wholly dedicated to prayer. From the time when prayer was an everyday occurrence in her family, Teresa knew what it was to live in the milieu of prayer. She says, it seemed to me that in this life there could be no greater good than the practice of prayer. Despite this conviction, Teresa, after only five years, five years as a professed nun, out of false humility, abandoned mental prayer. It says she abandoned prayer. It's clear she's talking about inner or mental prayer. The Chasian Carmelite then spent the rest of her life reminding anybody she could find and everybody who would read her, never, ever, ever abandon prayer. At age 39, Teresa received the gift of conversion. She described her spiritual state at the time. I wanted to live, for I well understood that I was not living but was struggling with the shadow of death. Teresa discovered the age-old principle of Christian spirituality. We live as well as we pray, and we pray as well as we live. Teresa discovered that the rule's primary imperative for her is that a Carmelite should remain in one cell or near it, day and night, meditating on the law of the Lord, and then quite possibly in repetitive prayer. That still has to be examined, what that word meditatio meant in the 13th century. Teresa uh, says, you have a rule, she tells the nuns at San Jose, and it commands you to pray unceasingly. For that, she says, is what it commands you, and keep it. That's her comments, not me. The large community at the Incarnation, high as, as, as we heard this morning, um, uh, during Teresa's time, recited in Latin the divine office, observed certain days of fasting and abstinence, had times for silence, and according to Father Kieran, uh, there was an austere life. So many of the nuns were, in fact, austere and observant, despite the difficulties. However, for Teresa, the ideals that she discovered in the Carmelite rule were compromised by certain drawbacks at the Incarnation. Enclosure was not in force. Comings and goings compromised silence and solitude. The Incarnation nuns accepted the mitigations, despite uh, Joachim of Pope Eugene IV, regarding fasting and abstinence from meat. Moreover, in the, as we heard before, there was a caste system at the Incarnacion. Um, the um, uh, wealthy doñas had lots of amenities. The poor nuns had almost nothing. These deficiencies prompted Teresa's design of life at San Jose. The community must be smaller so that silence and solitude be pervasive. Enclosure is to be in effect. And she did that before the Council of Trent and joined that on nuns. The monastery was to be simple and, where possible, founded in poverty. And most importantly of all, Teresa said to her nuns, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening of personal mental prayer. Teresa was plagued with lifelong poor health. A severe illness while at the Incarnation set her off for Torah to be treated by the quack at uh, Besedas, and on the way there, she ran into Uncle Pedro. Now, what you, if you've got a wish list for God, find an Uncle Pedro. Uncle Pedro uh, gave all kind of gifts to his, his niece, had him, uh, she, she wanted, he wanted her to read to her, and she said, I used to pretend like I like doing that. And then uh, he gives her on this visit a copy of the third spiritual alphabet by the Franciscan, uh, Francisco de Osuna. This book made a huge impact on Teresa. She says, I did not know how to proceed in prayer or how to be recollected, and so I was very happy with this book and resolved to follow that path with all my strength. Ozuna taught Teresa how to pray recollectively, how to go within, as Augustine had pointed out to her when she read those confessions avidly. A gift is a gift when it's freely given. And a gift is a gift when it's freely received. 
To give a gift is a risk. If you give a gift, may be refused, abused, forgotten about. If you receive a gift and it's a real gift, you're changed by that reception. This conference is called the gift of St. Teresa. And that's an important element of Carmelite spirituality. And let me see if I can explain it. I'm uh, wrestling with the, the clock up here. Um, the Carmelite motto of vocari deo, being empty or being at leisure for God, uh, sets the stage for Teresa's advice to her nuns that when it comes to contemplation, do nothing but receive. You have to be very humble. That's why she stresses humility. You have to, if, to know that what counts in life has to be received, that it comes from another, is humiliating for us who like to think we achieve things. And uh, Edith Stein, who knew her Teresa very well, says, the soul cannot live without receiving. Prayer, ordinary and infused prayer, are all gift. Receptivity, not action. Action is necessary for our lives, for getting meals on the table, uh, for the apostolate. Those are all important, but they may be filled with a false self if they're not come out of the gift received from God. That's why grace is a gift. Receptivity, 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 not action, is what the mystic does. And Teresa teaches us in the first dwelling place that one learns to be a receiver through self-knowledge, humility, freedom from disordered attachments, and the practice of mental prayer, first three uh, dwelling places. These actions are what make one available for the gift of prayer that Teresa describes in the rest of the dwelling place. Uh, you, what she describes there, uh, uh, union with through love followed by spiritual betrothal and spiritual marriage, where an excess of love is celebrated in union with the triune God. I've said this elsewhere and it's off the press, and the title of it is, Teresa, Prayer is an Adventure in Love. In her words, she says, exactly, prayer is an exercise in love. It's all about love. Teresa's treatise on prayer, often called the Prayer of the Four Waters, begins with a description of uh, active recollection, and she moves quickly, uh, as John does, into the description of mystical prayer, so that the wisdom they have there tells us all about what it means who God is for us. Uh, uh, Teresa calls mystical, uh, the encounter with God, uh, a mystical theology, an encounter with the all-living God who transforms one into the person God intended us to be. John says that explicitly. When Teresa wrote the prayer of the Four Waters, she had not yet received the gift of spiritual marriage. Nonetheless, Teresa shares with her readers that this discovery, when she says, when she gets to that, um, as far as she had gotten in the spiritual life, uh, prayer for her was mucho jover. It was like pouring rain from the sky. Uh, the grace and the prayer that she receives. And may I share this conviction, which I think if I had the time, and I don't, I, I could uh, prove, I think. Teresa is the one who brought bridal mysticism into the Carmelite tradition. Before that, John Cashin was the primary uh, uh, architect of Carmelite spirituality after a scripture. Contemplation, according to Teresa, is all gift. No amount of human effort creates contemplation, she comments. It would be very distressing for one who isn't a contemplative if she didn't understand that contemplation is a gift from God. Pretty strong words uh, for herself. What Teresa did before she received the first gift of mystical prayer was with the help of ordinary grace, she developed a contemplative disposition. Every human person has a contemplative disposition to be uh, uh, educated in. Uh, Teresa received the uh, gift of the transverberation, uh, and she says, it left me on fire with great love of God. These visits by the angel with the fiery dart began when Teresa was 45, two years before she leaves to found uh, San Jose. Um, John of the Cross, when he comments on uh, the transverberation, says it's uh, to be associated with foundresses. When did Teresa begin her foundations? 
after the receiving this gift, which she received over and over again. And by the way, uh, I, I won't be allowed out alive. There's a new book out, and uh, uh, brother, uh, brother Brian Paquette, who's known as Brian Paquette, 40%. <laughs> has this wonderful book on the foundations, a much neglected book by Teresa. The, the photography here is extraordinary. Do I get my share, Brian? And so it was that Teresa was ready to begin her reform of Carmelite life through new foundations far and wide. Teresa had done all that she could do, and God finished the sculpting, which God has to do for all of our identities. Uh, Teresa, uh, having received this gift, was then ready to depart the Incarnation, to take up her ministry as one who retrieved Carmel's original charism. Teresa's identity now was as a Carmelite who, through prayer, that's an ex exercise in love, was transformed into a woman on a mission uh, to share with the world her story of God's extravagant mercy. Uh, no, no, mercy was so important to her. And I'm getting the signal that I better stop. Uh, but let me just end with this. There's five minutes, Steve. I have five minutes there somewhere? Oh, well then, that's like having all day. Okay, all right, I'm all right, I'm all right, all right. Um, but what I've tried to say is by taking the rule with the Holy Fathers and re reading the uh, uh, rule and finding out how to live, it prepared Teresa to grow in her relationship with God in love and prepared her to do the mission that she was called upon to make foundations uh, and to show people how prayer, important prayer is to living a vigorous uh, Christian life. She does not anywhere use the language of deification, but her colleague, her confessor, John, does. And I think some of the things he says about de deification describes Teresa, uh, what she came to in her identity during the time that she was at the Incarnacion. This is John speaking about what a woman looks like uh, who is deified. I believe that this, and, and, and he's speaking about who, the person he calls Blessed Teresa of Jesus. This divine drink contemplation so deifies, elevates, and immerses her in God. She is, says John, as it were, divine and deified. Through her union with the most blessed trinity, she becomes deiform. And God, this is extraordinary. She should have been put in the Inquisition. She, you're God through participation. Bold and extreme. But that's what love's about. John speaks of the fire that God divinizes with and delights, and that it burns gently in someone. Made in the image and likeness of God, and with a deep desire, for natural desire for God, Teresa was transformed through love, and so became like God's very self. The likeness in love is what God created Teresa to be. That is her identity. That is her gift. And to use her words, she was willing to risk it all on that journey. You know the practice that John had of giving little slips of paper to those whom he gave spiritual guidance, and they became the counsels of love and life. We don't know if Teresa got those, uh, but if she did, uh, I'm sure one of them could be what John says about the end of all our lives. In the evening of life, we shall be examined on love. Teresa would pass that examination. Teresa did not like chatter about being a saint. Now, she no longer has to be embarrassed with that kind of talk, which she can't do much about it. <laughs> and were we to ask now, were she to arrive here, what would Teresa say to us if we'd say, who are you? Teresa would say, Teresa de Jesus Carmelita. Thank you.